Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this session. I'm super excited here uh, to be speaking with Philippe. Philippe, you've got a, this new Global Scape uh, report out, and there's so much, in, so many interesting bits in it. But let's focus on uh, a few that I guess the market, investors, uh, the broader tech industry is looking at. The first is around data center investment and return on investment. And you've, you've done a bit of work on there. And you're looking at kind of the revenues uh, that are required to justify the amount of capex uh, that is going into data centers over the next sort of four years or so. That's come out at about $3.1 trillion. That feels like a very big number, a very staggering number. Can you contextualize for that uh, and just give us your thinking into what's going to drive that revenue? Sure, so ha happy to put that in, uh, in context. I think what we're seeing right now is that we have a, a big need for data center build out for model training and for inferences, both for native, uh, native AI application and for the agentic revolution that we expect is going to take you know, another year or two in the, uh, in the enterprise. And so we estimate that this is around 117 gigawatt of capacity that needs to be built in the next five years, and that's the four trillion dollar that that you see on this slide. So, four trillion dollar. I mean, this is a gigantic number, right? I mean, four trillion. This is the GDP of China, uh, not the GDP. Sorry, the the budget of uh, annual budget of China. So, how do we put that into context? I mean, first, if you look at five companies of five U.S. hyperscaler. Over the same period of time, the next five years, they are going to generate $5.5 trillion of operating cash flow. So just these five companies can afford it, and some, and that's without leverage. So if you add leverage to it, that's even a bigger number. So yes, $4 trillion is big, but it can be afforded. Now, the question is, you know, what, how do you get the payback on that? I mean. We, people can see in the report, there is a bit of math here, but we estimate that it's about $3.1 trillion of additional revenue that needs to be generated over the, the next five years. And that's obviously you know, a very big number. But again, here we're talking about a technology that can improve the productivity of the world. So I think the right comparison number is the global GDP, which is around $125 trillion. And if you think that AI can increase the compound average growth rate of this GDP in the next five years, then you pay back your investment. So I think the question for the crowd here is, do you think it's reasonable to assume that AI can increase the global GDP by an additional one two percent per year? What do you think are the, the potential bottlenecks here, Philippe? Because I've uh, you know, been having conversations over the past couple of days and there's been a debate about what the demand from enterprise, for example, is going to look like, whether what ChatGPT and some of these other companies are doing is monetizable to drive that revenue. Um, are there any potential bottlenecks that you see that might sort of uh, derail some of the, the optimism around uh, adoption? Well, I mean, I, I think this forecast assumes that everything uh, you know, will go right in, uh, you know, in some ways. And that means a lot of things. That means that this data center you know, can be built uh, in time, then the chipset needs to be produced uh, uh, in time. That needs that the adoption of the application in the enterprise, uh, you know, is going to continue to happen at the, the same pace. Uh, but I think the question is that, you know, if you don't do that, then I think the missed opportunity is bigger than, you know, if you're over invest. Uh, and as we've shown, I think the, the companies who are making this investment, they can offer it. They can't afford to overinvest, but they cannot offer to underinvest. And that's why we're, we're seeing this amount of investment right now. But I think what makes me optimistic is that if you look at the, the new wave of AI na native application that we're seeing right now, you look at the cursor, you look at you know, the perplexity, you look at the Synthesia, you look at the Sierra, the Lovable, etc. I mean, their growth rate is insane. I mean, these are growth rates that we've never seen before. And most of them are, are achieving this growth rate with a level of efficiency that we've not seen. Meaning that if you look at the revenue per headcount of this company, it is you know, 10, 10 times higher than what we have seen in traditional software companies. And it's hard to talk about the data center without talking about the companies you know, building it, uh, the hyperscalers 
they're all American. I think you note in your report that the big six firms over in the US account for about 50% of the NASDAQ's market cap, which is incredible concentration. Um, when we look at who's making money from AI right now, it's very easy to look at the picks and shovels, the NVIDIAs of the world, the hyperscalers, the cloud companies um, as well. Will that concentration eventually filter out? Or is, to what your point earlier, the amount of capex required that can only be met by a handful of companies going to just increase the power and concentration of US big tech? Well, I think you have to look at AI in three different layers, right? You have the infrastructure layers and the data center, you have the models, and then you have the application that are built on top. Uh, I mean, the first two buckets require a lot of capital. And so it's natural that the company that you're seeing on these slides um, are taking the lion's share of it because they are the ones who have the cash flow to uh, invest. But that said, uh, when you look at the application side, there's a lot of opportunity here to build great companies uh, that are kind of leveraging this model, this infrastructure, and which can create an enormous amount of value. And I think what's, uh, what's interesting here is that these companies don't require a lot of capex to be built. Uh, that requires the normal amount of venture investments. Um, and we think that's, you know, very, they create very exciting investment opportunities for us. D does the, the big concern is that the, the concentration of power with these US companies could lead to another generation of European companies that might not be able to, to compete. Um, from what you're seeing, from the companies invested in, we know there's been some early European success stories uh, so far. Um, how do you see Europe's ability to compete in this, this new AI age? Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, what's, what we think is very exciting here is that, um, so first, AI is driving venture funding in you know, software, in AI application at an all-time high, which is 184 billion dollar for 2025, uh, which is slightly above, above the peak of 2021. Now, if you look at how this is uh, broken down, you know, about 60% of that has, been, has gone into the, the big model, the Entropic, the OpenAI, um, and 40% of that has gone into application. And the part that has gone into application uh, is actually very balanced uh, between the US and Europe and Israel. So that's basically 45 billion in the US and 30 billion for Europe and Israel. So basically Europe is about two thirds of the US, right? Which is probably the, if you look at the past 10 years, one of the highest proportion um, compared to the, the, the US market. And that's not a surprise, because if you look at what Europe has produced, I mean, Europe has produced a lot of champion in AI. I mean, category, I mean, champions, maybe emerging champions, I would say. But you look at, you know, the Synthesia in terms of bringing video to the, to the enterprise. You look at Sierra in data and AI security. You look at, you look at Lovable in, uh, you know, in Vibe COVID. You did, and at end, you know, DevTool and, you know, all the enablers to build the, this application. Uh, you look at 11 labs. I mean, these are big names, but they are leader in their respective fields. So obviously the, the US also has its winners. Uh, and of, of course you have the, the perplexity of the world and, and the cursor and the Decagon and the Sierra, et cetera. Uh, but it is fairly even race from what we're seeing. And are there, you know, we, we, you said it, you were talking about it uh, earlier on, on CNBC about how it's still very early, you know, it's early innings yeah. uh, in this kind of tech development. Um, but are there real business models emerging? You know, there's a difference between, you know, fast revenue growth and quality revenue growth, and then that path to profitability as well for some of these companies. As you look at this kind of early phase uh, of these companies growing, are you seeing clear business models emerging and also defendable moats uh, as well? Yes, so I, I think that's, uh, that's a very, there are two different questions here is, you know, do we see these models enduring? Like, yes, I mean, I think the, the amount of productivity that is being gained by using these new applications uh, based on journey AI models, I think is stunning. So yes, they are not gonna go away. Um, but like, you know, in any technology shift, you have a lot of companies that are being funded not all of them are going to succeed. And then the question is, you know, what's going to make the one that are going to succeed, succeed? 
Um, and when we look at it, it's, you know, obviously a lot of it is in the founders. I mean, the founders are the heart of any, any companies. Uh, and that's something we're very focused on. Um, but then in, if you look at in terms of the product, uh, the key here is to build a product layer on top of the model that is very differentiated. Uh, because every company are going to use more or less the same models, and if you look at the performance of LLM, it's kind of evening out. But the layer that you're building on top is what makes uh, the difference. And if you look at the, the companies that have been successful, like the Lovable, the Synthesia, you look at their founder, and they're really product obsessed. And that's really what we're looking for, and that's what we think is going to make the, uh, the differentiation. And then there is another aspect of it, which is like, how do you bring these technologies to market? And here we're seeing uh, two different models. You have bottom-up adoption, community-driven model. And if you look at you know, kind of the lovable, the cursor, the N8, and that's kind of how they manage their growth. And so looking for founders who know how to create, manage, animate this community is very important. And then you have companies that have a more uh, kind of direct to enterprise, focusing on enterprise first and landing very big deals first. Um, and that needs, uh, you know, very big, you know, kind of enterprise go-to-market expertise. Uh, and that's what you see in companies like uh, Synthesia or Sierra in uh, security. Mm. Um, Philippe, just as we, you know, last five, six minutes of the conversation, just want to sort of uh, zoom out a little bit and talk about uh, the big debate here, I guess, at Web Summit and, and throughout the last few weeks, which is the financial markets. Are we in a bubble? Has the AI trade gone too far? Are valuations too rich? There's a debate that's going on and there's no clear kind of uh, side that's emerging as, as more vocal. But, but what's your view uh, on, on these questions? Yeah, I, I think it is a very valid question. That's a question we're asking ourselves every day. Uh, so first thing I would say to put things into context, if you look at the past 15 years, there have been three big technology shifts. You had mobile, you had cloud, you have, you have AI. So let's say 2010, 15, that was mobile, NASDAQ doubled. Uh, 15, 20, that was cloud, NASDAQ doubled. 2020, 2025, AI, NASDAQ doubled. So from a public market standpoint at a high level, the increase in valuation we're seeing in NASDAQ is in line with historical average. Now, let's look at what's happening uh, today, like on the investment level, what we're seeing on the market. I mean, any big platform shift uh, is generating a lot of opportunities, so a lot of companies are getting created. And I think with AI, the value creation uh, uh, potential here you know, is very large, and that drives frost evaluations. So yes, we're seeing frost evaluation today, but I think what's important is to recognize that given the amount of opportunity we have in front of us, not all companies are going to succeed, but the ones that are going to succeed are going to create a lot of value, right? And it is our job as an investor to be able to pick the right company, even if the valuations are high, that are going to create you know, a lot of value, and then we're going to make a very big return on these ones. Because you believe the valuations now are going to be orders of magnitude larger in a few years, if you get it right? I mean, it, it is like uh, any previous technology shift. I mean, if you look at Amazon in 2010, that was a pretty big buying opportunity, right? So maybe it looked high at the time, but uh, not maybe not in 2010, but like in 2012 or 13, it looked high, but now you know, it looked pretty small compared to where it is today. Are there any signs at the moment, just from your sitting where you are as a VC, of, of any distress in the markets, any imminent corrections that people should be concerned about? I mean, it's very hard to predict a, a correction, uh, and we're not that much focused on what's gonna happen tomorrow. I think our job as investor in a private market, I mean, we try to invest in company at a very, early stage and then follow them through their entire cycle. So when we make an investment, we're more, you know, we're thinking about what's going to happen in the next five, seven years and not what's going to happen tomorrow. And maybe there's going to be a correction tomorrow. Maybe there's going to be a correction in 18 months from now. Maybe there is not. Like, I don't know. But it doesn't change our belief that there are enormous value creation opportunity right now. Uh, and uh, we're very excited to be meeting all these entrepreneurs who are going after it. Philippe, just thinking about the, the future of it, what do you think, I guess, currently is most underappreciated about AI? 
Well, I think what is hard to appreciate right now, and, and it's probably like in any technology, we always underappreciate what's going to happen in the future, uh, is really, you know, what is the ultimate potential of AI? Like, where, where is this going to lead us? How fast are the model going to, uh, you know, going to continue to improve? And, you know, if you picture ourselves, like, just even two years ago, it would have been hard to say, well, in two years, we'll be where we are today. And I think for me, it's kind of hard to say, well, where are these models going to be in five years from now? And what are the things that they're going to be able to do that they're not going to be able to do? Um, so I, I think to me, this is kind of the, 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 the key question. But the thing which is also interesting is, is if, you just, if you just look at what the models are doing today, we are probably only leveraging in the enterprise maybe 10 or 15% of it. So even if that acceleration takes longer time, there is still a lot to do with where the models are today. If we are sat here in, in a year's time or so, what do you think are going to be the key things we're going to be talking about uh, in a year? Well, I, I think uh, we'll probably be going to be talking about AI, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think the, uh, one of the, the, the key questions that I have for, for the next uh, couple of years is, you know, when are we going to see um, a gigantic revolution happening in the enterprise? I think today uh, we're seeing some interesting examples of uh, agentic deployment in the enterprise, but we're clearly not at the vertical you know, part of the, uh, the S-curve. And I think the, you know, the, the reason for that is partly due to the models, uh, which, as we know, LLMs are probabilistic. So, and to automate an enterprise process, you need to have you know, 10, 15 tasks done in a row. And then when you have a slight di divergence for every task, after 15, there's a big divergence, which doesn't really suit the uh, kind of an enterprise setup. So there's probably uh, more work to do on the model side to make them work for the enterprise. And then there's a question of you know, compliance and security and everything that needs to be put in place. Um, for, it, you know, for these technologies to be enterprise ready. My guess that's going to happen in the next couple of years. And probably, I mean, I hope that's going to be one of the topics to discuss next year. Great, Philippe. Uh, wonderful insight. Thank you for running us through all of that. Uh, you know, people can find the whole report online uh, as well uh, today. Uh, lots more interesting things in that. But I think that's a great overview and insight into what's happening right now and over the next few years. Philippe Botteri, partner at Accel, everyone. Round of applause. <laughs> well, thank you, Arjun.